one and all to yet another edition of Escape from Vault Disney, the podcast where we review movies, TV shows, and short films available on the Disney Plus streaming service, chosen completely at random. I'm your host, Tony Goldmark. Joining me once again is Zach Hurst. Well, hello there. And we've got a couple of guests appearing for the very first time on Escape from Vault Disney. First off, all the way from Colorado, you've seen him in various videos of mine. You saw him back in the day on the old Geek Vision show quest for geekdom where he played arthur knowledge ladies and gentlemen kevin anderson hey hey how y'all doing and also joining me for the very first time here on escape from vault disney you know him as tiny mayfield at knott's berry farms ghost town alive you know him from the podcast tales of the liberty flyer and you know him from the youtube series remain seated with chris nebergall ladies and gentlemen chris nebergall you can hear me but you cannot see me sadly what we are about to see is Jack from 1996. Oh. Now, I have actually seen this movie and we'll get into my experiences with this movie, but have any of the rest of you ever seen Jack? I, I have. I have seen trailers for this. Zach, have you seen Jack? I have not, which is really weird considering I'm a huge Robin Williams fan. I haven't even heard of this one. Really. Right. This is a Robin Williams movie from 1996 where he plays a guy who ages four times faster than normal. So he's 10 years old, but he has the body of a 40 year old. Basically Basically, kids Benjamin Button. Kinda, yeah. It's similar in some respects. There will uh, be inevitable comparisons with the Tom Hanks classic Big, I'm mm. sure. Was that just a thing in the 90s where they were just like, you know what every child wants to be? 40. That's what every kid dreams of. <laughs> you can eat all the cake you want and nobody can tell you to stop. But also taxes. Womp womp. <laughs> <laughs> now, a couple of interesting things about this movie. Number one, it's directed by none other than, and I'm not kidding, Francis Ford Coppola. No yep. way. I was yes shocked way. when I learned that too. So that could mean it's either going to be amazing or amazingly terrible. Oh, or it's the latter. Definitely. It doesn't even remotely feel like a Francis Ford Coppola movie. It kind of feels like Francis Ford Coppola trying to recreate what his childhood might have been like but it has nothing in common with most childhoods of the 90s, and it's supposed <laughs> to take place in modern day, and this is 10 years after Captain EO, so if you thought that was oh. his worst movie, you ain't seen nothing yet. And speaking of problematic celebrities, you know who else is in this movie? Oh, boy. Cosby. Yep. <sighs> Bill see, Cosby plays Jack's tutor. For a moment, I was worried, because in the preview, it looks like he's being threatened by Ohio Representative Jim Jordan. <laughs> I think that's his dad. I think that actor's playing his dad. Want to come into the showers, Robbie? I promise it'll be okay. This is what makes it fascinating to me that the movie Jack is even on Disney Plus because Cosby made a Disney movie back in the early 80s called The Devil and Max Devlin. That is not on Disney Plus, even though practically everything else from that era of Disney is. I guess they figured if we put that on Disney Plus, then Cosby's ugly mug will be staring He's back. He's on the at, poster. Yeah, he's yeah. on the poster. It's kind of hard to obscure him. Whereas in Jack, he's got more of a cameo supporting role. It's not really a cameo. He does appear several times throughout the movie. But let's just say he gets the and credit and Bill Cosby as the tutor. Just shows up in a post-credit scene with an eye patch. I'm here to talk to you about the <laughs> comedian edition. Oh, no. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, no, thank you. I would rather not do that. <laughs> Not with you, sir. A couple years ago, I was working on this one project that never actually really wound up happening for various reasons. I don't want to say what it was because I still might eventually do it in a completely different form, but suffice it to say, part of the project was watching every movie Cosby was in that I could get my hands on. And that meant I watched Jack. So I actually watched Jack semi-recently, like a couple of years ago, and... It is fucking wretched. Oh, boy. It is oh really, dear. really bad. I've seen this movie. I had the clamshell VHS of it as a kid. I oh don't know boy. why, because I only ever watched it like once or oh, twice. Yeah. I also saw this in theaters. Oh, wow. I hated oh. it then. I saw this in theaters as a kid because I was like, hey, Robin Williams, he's funny. I also hated it as a kid. Well, I didn't hate it, I guess, but I was utterly indifferent to it. I was disappointed because... 
This movie is one of those movies that it's marketed as a kid's movie. It's a kid's kind of premise, but it's utterly boring for a kid because it turns out it's trying to be this heartfelt drama about aging and mortality. Mm-hmm. And that is just not something that kids understand Francis or Ford care Coppola about. made a movie about aging and mortality, you say. I know. Who yeah. would have oh. thunk? Where's the fun shenanigans? I was promised fun shenanigans. And as a kid, I just remember, well, that was a waste of my time. And as adults... Everything else about it just seems wrongheaded. Kevin here flew all the way from Colorado to visit with people in general, but also to be on Escape from Vault Disney. And we were really hoping the randomizer would give us a really bad one. We hit the <laughs> jackpot, so to speak. Yeah, literally. literally the jackpot. I've been listening to the podcast at work every Wednesday. Well, thank and you. And I kept hoping, do I get a decom? Do I get a terrible <laughs> documentary? Do I get some of that Nat Geo reality TV that's Ugh, coming in? Got that two I weeks get ago. Jack. You get Jack. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a complete train wreck. I don't know why Coppola agreed to make it. Maybe the box office returns for Bram Stoker's Dracula wasn't what he was expecting. So it's like, well, I got to make this dumb Disney movie with Robin Williams in order to get any cred in the business and gave him even less cred. So Coppola is kind of like M. Night Shyamalan, where he has a few legendary gems early in his career. And then since then, it's just been... Oh, what are you doing? Uh, no, yeah. no, no. Remember last year when Scorsese went on his whole thing about how Marvel movies are just theme parks and Coppola backed him up and said, yeah, he's right. Marvel movies are terrible. It's like, bitch, you directed Captain EO. <laughs> yeah. You literally made a theme park movie. The first what one. The fuck? You made the first that like started a <laughs> genre of movies made for theme parks. And then he yep. made Jack. Abandon all hope ye who watch this. <laughs> I am I'm going to try and remain neutral going into it but you guys are making it real hard so ladies and gentlemen we will be right back with our thoughts on jack parentheses 1996 close parentheses dir period francis ford fucking coppola on escape from vault disney okay we just watched jack Mother oh, of God. That was the most excruciating piece of shit. Horror. It feels... I, it, I, I, horror. I don't want to say it was worse than Meet the Deedles, but it's fucking up there. It doesn't feel so much like we watched Jack as much as we stared into the abyss until the abyss showed us Jack. Jack watched oh, us. Oh, God. That was interminable torment. Where do we even fucking begin? I'll say this much. There is a good movie somewhere in here, but it was called Big. Every scene feels like a whole movie long. This movie is about 40 minutes worth of scenes stretched out painfully oh, over God. two hours. To I swear, an hour this, 53. This yeah. may be the most boring movie I have saved away in my memory ever seeing. It is so interminable. As a kid, you go to see a Robin Williams movie, you're expecting the genie from Aladdin, you're expecting Peter at the end of Hook, he's flying off the walls, he's freewheeling, he's improvising, and here he's just a sad piece of shit who lays around the house all day and doesn't fucking do anything. He doesn't have a fun personality, even as a kid, he just plays this nervous, quiet kid who barely says anything, and he just looks sad for the whole movie, and it's boring as hell. The other thing that Robin Williams was known for around this time is he would do the dramedies for adults like Good Will Hunting, Dead Poets Society, Patch Adams. Yeah, this was a year before he won the Oscar for Good Will Hunting. Yeah, it can't decide which Robin Williams movie it wants to be. Is this a Mrs. Doubtfire or is this Good Will Hunting? It feels like he signed on for a dramatic role and then suddenly the studio went in and went, no, this has to be funnier. It wants to be a serious drama and then it takes a hard left field into, we're gonna get into wacky shenanigans because this is a 90s movie. But for like a minute at a time, and then it's done. It is weird that you guys keep saying it's meant like a children's movie, and then I'm looking, it's rated PG-13. It is. So like, It's got fucking boner jokes in it. Yeah. And it was marketed for kids. It feels like everyone at every different level of making the movie wanted to make a different movie. Yeah. Coppola wanted to make this serious drama about this kid with an unfortunate affliction who has to stay inside all the time and be a sad sack, and it's this ponderance of mortality and shit, and the studio just wanted another Home Alone, so they gotta put shenanigans in the movie so they can put those shenanigans in the trailer, and it's just, none of it fits together. And it also kind of feels like it was written 
backwards. The idea for it was they had like a valedictorian speech given by an old man. Right. That was the premise. And then from there, well, how does that make sense? Well, clearly it's got to be like a kid that ages super fast. Can we talk about just how bad the script structure of this movie is? From the writer of The Purge. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. guy who made the first three Purge movies co-wrote this piece of he, shit. He, there, okay, there so we scenes. looked it up in the middle of the movie. He wrote all four of them. Okay. Only directed oh the first three of them. Gotcha. But this movie has two screenwriters. The second screenwriter, the only other thing he's really known for is Angels in the End Zone. Oh! Okay. The straight-to-DVD sequel to Angels in the Outfield. I don't even think that's on Disney+. Plus. Oh, my God. He's also known for a Disney Channel original movie about a chimpanzee that learns sign language. and That might be on Disney+. Plus. That probably is. The tagline for that movie is, they taught him to read. He taught them to listen. <laughs> oh, oh, God. That makes me. way too much sense. Kill me. It is weird that the two things the guy is known for is a movie with Robin Williams and a sign language monkey when Robin Williams is friends with a sign language speaking monkey. This movie feels like a bad student film drama, like something oh, I would have seen yeah. in college and just rolled my eyes at for 20 minutes, but it's for two hours. Every scene is just so awkward. There's no storytelling in it. The dialogue doesn't flow. The scenes don't have a point. There's never anything to hook onto. Characters just mumble and talk, and there's long pauses, and every scene is painful. So what you're saying is it's boyhood if the kid was played by a 40-year-old man. <laughs> yes. Speaking of which, can we talk about the fucking kids in this movie? Oh, my None God. None of them act like kids. The main kid who befriends Jack, Louie, he talks like a fucking newsie, and he's got the hair of a 50s greaser. He's got a fucking pompadour, my and he's supposed to be a says, 90s kid. My I old mean, man says it'll freeze right to the pole. I mean, his <laughs> mom is Fran Drescher, so I guess some of that... Happens. We need some sort of ordinance in Hollywood. Old men are not allowed to direct movies about kids unless it's a period piece. Yes. If it's a period piece to when they were kids, fine, we'll give you a pass. You're not allowed to direct movies about kids today. The kids talk like they're from the 50s and dress like they're from the 80s and it's supposed to be set in the 90s. This movie has no idea where it's supposed to be set. San Francisco. That's about all we know. Yeah. And by the way, I grew up in San Francisco. It is never that sunny. No. I don't know where the hell they shot this but Universal yeah, I guarantee Studios. you probably it's the worst superhero movie since Batman vs <laughs> Superman Disney Plus listed as a superhero yes. movie I don't know why. I guess it's kind of a superpower, even though he can't really do anything with it except buy porn. We assumed that it was because Diane Lane is in it and Robin yeah, Williams yeah. wears the Superman shirt at one yeah, point. So he Second. dresses as Superman for Halloween in one scene. The sad thing is, she's still a better Martha in this than oh, yeah. she is in the Snyderverse. Why did you say that name? Oh, I think somebody's stupid rationale was, well, he's magically different than everybody. Super older serum. Like the end of Endgame. Yeah. yeah. I used to know somebody who actually saw the 2002 Roberto Benini Pinocchio movie. I oh. saw that too. And my friend's reaction to seeing it was, I'm a real 40-year-old man. <laughs> <laughs> and that phrase kept going through my head watching this movie. I'm a real 40-year-old man. I remember as a kid not liking it because there was nothing for kids in it. Yeah, and it's... I was reconfirmed. This movie has... Nothing, nothing for kids it in nothing it. nothing for anyone. Nothing for anyone. Who is this for? My biggest note, I wrote in just big letters, bad touch. Oh, God. there's just so much. We are all now on a watch list. You realize that, right? <laughs> We're all on a federal watch list for watching this movie yeah. because oh, Fran God. Drescher wants to fuck him, and she doesn't know he's 10 years old. He never fucking tells her. Yeah, this is by the epilogue. She figured shit out. I guess so. What was that scene like? What was the I, scene where she finally... Re Holy fuck, I was hitting on a 10-year-old and he didn't tell me? There's I, a lot of accidental pedophilia in this movie. What I think happened was someone was writing a fetish movie. Their spouse walked in on them and he was like, No, honey, I'm writing a serious drama. I'm selling it to Francis Ford Coppola. <laughs> and even well, as a and serious Disney's drama. And Disney's going to produce it. You'll see. How about the scene where he hits on J-Lo? Which one? Well, like, yeah, the sexual there's the gummy bear scene, scene and right. then there's like the go on a date with me scene. Yeah, he does this fucking awkward flirtation with Jennifer Lopez who plays his teacher and he's kind of got a crush on her and eventually in the most 
uncomfortable fucking scene. He asks her out and she's trying to politely turn him down. And then finally, when he gets the fucking message eight hours into the scene, he and fucking runs out of the room heartbroken. And then he has a goddamn heart attack. Because he's got Victorian the heart stairs. disease. Yeah. The heart attack happened because of the heartbreak because he's old. This was a year after Jennifer Lopez did Selena. She was a rising star. She didn't need to do this shit unless she just wanted to work with Coppola and Robin Williams, I guess. There are just these looks that Jennifer Lopez gives Robin Williams as Jack. And I'm just like, do you want to fuck your student? Fetish movie. (laughs) They were writing a porno and had to hastily rewrite it so that their wives wouldn't leave them. Speaking of porno, all these 10-year-olds are obsessed with fucking porno mags. Yeah. And that is the gateway to their friendship with Jack. Because it's he can get them. Because he can go get a porn magazine. Yeah. It's not because they like him as a person or anything. No. Even, like, the big heartfelt what speech. What is there to like about him as a person? Nothing. Even the big heartfelt speech the kid gives at the end where he's like, man, I miss Jack. It's all about how he's an adult but with a kid's brain. He's really talking about Robin Williams. Yeah. I mean, in a sense if it didn't have this horrible movie preceding it the end of this movie could actually function as a pretty heartwarming and moving eulogy for robin williams but unfortunately it has the fucking movie preceding that's the funny thing the speech he makes at the end for the graduation he's supposed to be fucking 70 he looks maybe 50 yeah and all they do is fucking gray his hair they didn't give him wrinkles on his face or anything yeah he looks he looks like christopher lloyd in back to the future he does not pretty much the speech that he gives was edited over like a month montage of his things as part of a tribute to him and that went all over Facebook for a while right. because the speech at the end doesn't work in the movie but it works perfectly as a it eulogy really for yeah. Robin Williams it just did it 20 years too early what made Robin Williams so awesome what made him such a great charismatic performer is that yeah he had the energy of a 10 year old but he's still very much approaching things from an adult point of view he had the perfect balance to it where he's filtering adult observations through a 10 year old sense of whimsy but an actual 10 year old wouldn't have those observations so he's just left twisting in the wind he doesn't have anything to do in this movie aside from occasionally misinterpret shit like the fucking Michael McKean scene oh god he goes to a fucking bar for no reason and he runs into Michael McKean as another bar patron who's telling him this story about not being able to get a boner when he's with a woman and he's telling yeah i was limp oh your leg hurt yeah i was there in my birthday suit it was your birthday yeah the director of the godfather ladies and gentlemen earlier in the film his little kid friend makes him pretend to be the super uh, principal sorry the principal the super principal (laughs) makes him pretend to be the principal to distract the kid's mom while the kid gets away with the kid's mom played by fran drescher and fran drescher is super super into him and later they run into each other at the bar and they start dancing and Robin Williams is looking at another guy dancing with his girlfriend nearby and mimicking his moves. Right. And the guy touches his girlfriend's butt. So Robin Williams touches her butt. And then it becomes Bad almost touch. pedophilia. And it's going to happen until a bar fight breaks out. I'm not going like, to lie. I was sitting here just fully expecting that to be what happened at the end of that scene. Yeah. Was yeah. for her to just take him. And that was like, I well, was fully expecting them to wake up in bed together. Yeah. Good Lord. So, so at like, least the movie had some restraint. Well, honestly, I almost would have preferred that because at least then it would have had an edge. At least then it would have been like, yeah, it's bad, but at least it was doing something instead of just jogging further in oh, place. I'm glad uh, you said that, Zachary Hurst of <laughs> Simi Valley, California. You, but you know what I mean. Put him on the watch list. Anyone I'm not listening. saying I condone it. No, no I'm just saying not. that if I have You're to watch it. You're just saying that's what you wanted to see in this feature film. <laughs> Did anyone what see- were you saying about this being a fetish film? <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone else see that? forgettable Brad Pitt, Benjamin Button movie. I, I, I saw that. I never actually I saw, saw that. that. No. Like, I tried to multiple times. Every time I rented it or bought it, the disc never you worked. You got halfway through it, and then you said, I'm getting too young for this shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, that one is very Oscar Beatty, very generic, right. but it's competent with largely the same concept. It actually works. Somebody who's seen big more recently than me, if there is one in this room, 
Doesn't he have a love interest in Big? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, does. he does. So Big does the same thing. In Big, they do the joke where the woman says, I think I want to sleep with you tonight. And he says, you mean sleep over? Yeah. Okay, but I get the top bunk. Yeah. yeah. And then they're sleeping in bunk beds. They make it a cute joke in that yeah. where it could yeah. have gone creepy. Here, they try to pull back in a similar way, but it still gets creepy. Going back to Benjamin Bun, the way they make that work is one person's going forward, one person's going backward, and they meet in the middle, and it's... Kind of sad. Right in the first five minutes of the movie, we're treated to Robin Williams accidentally ripping off Bill Cosby's pants. Oh, oh God. God. I forgot about that. As oh, wrestle, remind me. As they wrestle playfully on the floor. How about the scene where Robin Williams gets the fucking penthouses for these kids, and they're looking at it, and one of them says, do you think our moms look like that? Yeah. Oh, God. Bad Touch. Fetish. Bad Fetish. Bad touch. Motherfucking. Literally. None of the kids in this movie act remotely like realistic kids. Nope. Like, no. There's the scene where he first enters the classroom, this 40-year-old man, and all the kids are like, I'm not asking him, you ask him. They're like too nervous to ask. If those were real kids, they would be lining up to ask him all the most insensitive questions yes. in the world. It's like Francis Ford Coppola didn't even go to school. It's not just the kids that act weird. Robin Williams himself is not playing a 10-year-old. He's playing a 4-year-old. He still wears full-body pajamas. He still is tripping over his own feet. Well, Louie fucking wears a onesie in one goddamn right. scene. It's the 90s. That was not a good era for wardrobes. Even considering that, this was fucking heinous. I get that it's supposed to be a joke like, oh, Robin Williams is a 10-year-old who looks like a 40-year-old. We're gonna put him in 10-year-old clothes just size for a 40-year-old man, and it's so unsettling. Ugh. It's so creepy. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind did that, where they have a grown Jim Carrie playing a child, but it's meant to be unsettling. Yeah, right. it's a dream. It's like the bad inverse of Big. Like, in Big, you have Tom Hanks as a kid masquerading as an adult, but in this movie, you have this grown man literally dressing as a kid and acting as a kid, and it's just, oh, I don't want to see that. That's creeping me out. This movie mythologizes childhood wrong. The things the kids in this movie do for fun is not what 90s kids did for fun. Maybe it's what kids did for fun when fucking Coppola was growing up. I didn't see one fucking video game not in this Not a console movie. in sight. The treehouse has a TV in it, but they never watch it. The gross out bowl. They put a bunch of random crap in a bowl and it's like, Oh, for your initiation, you have to take a big bite. We're all about the same age. Did any of us do that when we were a kid? No. no. It's like his rubric for childhood was the Sandlot and the 50s. He never spoke to a child about no, I, what do you do for fun? Heck, I'm going to throw it out there to anyone who's listening to this podcast. Right. If you did this, tweet at any of us. Sure. Tweet at the podcast. <laughs> I swear we have never seen this outside of a Nickelodeon kid sitcom. There's a scene in the treehouse where they all sing that children's classic that kids in the 90s were always singing, Charlie Brown by the Coasters. A, a song from fucking 1959. The name Charlie Brown isn't even synonymous <laughs> with the song Charlie Brown anymore. And Cosby's fucking teaching it to them and he's like, this is a very cool song and if you don't like it, I'm gonna give you the pudding with the drugs in it. <laughs> The mom actually makes pudding at one yeah. point in the movie, yeah. and she's like, better eat it while it's hot. It's like, oh, who, who eats hot, hot pudding? pudding? Who are these people? Yeah. One of the only scenes I remember from watching this at age, what was I, five, six, was the farting contest. Oh, wait, this is a kid's movie? We better put fart jokes in there. They store the fart in a um, can of in a can of beans. Oh, how about the scene where Robin Williams first gets to the treehouse and all that dumb slapstick, like he's oh, banging yeah. around. He's like, oh, sorry. Oh, oh no, I tripped over everything. Oh, no, the kid. Oh, dang. Oh, I just. Oh, dang. Oh, what's going? Oh, I just threw everything out the window. The first time they go up to the treehouse, you hear like this. I'm like, oh, it's going to fall apart at some point, isn't it? <laughs> and it certainly does. Oh, it does. So the movie is supposed to be this drama where funny things happen. 
except for the magical realism of Robin Williams' disease, it's supposed to feel like the real world. But then there's this scene where all the kids, plus Robin Williams and Bill Cosby, are in the treehouse, and it's overloaded to its extreme. And a butterfly lands <laughs> oh, on the treehouse, and that's the thing that tips the scales and causes it to come crashing down, like we're in Mouse Hunt all of a sudden. Because <laughs> nobody suspects <laughs> the butterfly. butterfly. It's a symbol it was, of I an animal that lives for like I didn't a break short the treehouse. It was the butterfly. The yeah. butterfly, I tell you. That butterfly keeps showing up. Like at the beginning, we see it as a caterpillar, and it crawls into the cocoon, and Jack is just intently watching it. And then at the end, when Jack is up in his room all depressed because he went to the bar and got punched out and realized, oh, the world's a sad place, I guess. I don't know. The butterfly, the, con- the butterfly flies in and then dies. Yeah. And that's... And was the butterfly thing? is the symbol for an animal that doesn't live very long. Let's all remember what Coppola said. There's nothing so terrible as a pretentious movie. No. <laughs> no. Well, nothing. It, it doesn't even feel like it's pretentious at that point. It feels like they just watched Patch Adams and stole it. This was two years before Patch Adams. Oh, Jesus. Oh, dear God. You know, it's astonishing the cast they got for this movie. Fran Drescher plays the woman who hits on Jack. Jennifer Lopez played his teacher. Don Novello was the bartender. Fucking Father Guido Sarducci. <laughs> oh, yeah. He doesn't get anything funny to do. That was a waste of casting. Again, everyone just wanted to work with Coppola. Everyone was wasted. Back to Bill Cosby for a second. Sure. There has to be a story as to oh, why I never he's to hear that movie. sentence back to Bill Cosby. <laughs> oh, but there has to be a story as to why he's in this movie because it is not the He kind wanted of role. to work with Coppola, I That's guess. That's got to be it or the studio said, "Oh, get Bill Cosby and Robin Williams in a movie together. That'll work, be great." And then, then you look at like half debt. the scenes, he is so checked out. There's so many shots in this movie where Bill Cosby and Robin Williams are the only two people in shot. It's like the dad from Walk Hard. The wrong one died. Then there's all these scenes where it's just Bill Cosby, it's Robin Williams, and a bunch of kids. And yep. in hindsight, this is just painful to watch. It's bad enough that the movie has Bill Cosby in it, but it's not even like using Cosby well. No. no. It this does very nothing un- with Well, him. it'd be very hard to use Cosby like well in hindsight, of course. Yeah. He had talents as a performer. Sure. None of them were here. No. It he does a funny face at one point when he tastes the gross gack in the treehouse. It feels like... What? They have a treehouse! That's the other fucking yeah. thing. Yeah. What kid in the 90s, honest to God, had a treehouse? A multi-level treehouse at that. We yeah. the TV! Again, Ugh. Twitter, if we are completely wrong, let us know. Sure. Maybe it's not? just because we're Californians. People from elsewhere, I mean... No! no you're I, from I, Kevin's I'm from okay. Colorado. You're from Colorado. I grew up okay. in Indiana. Yeah, I can't... That never happened. I didn't this grow up in California, but I grew up in... poor, so no one I knew would have had a tree This house. movie okay. takes place in California. There's no excuse. Yeah. This movie also does one of my least favorite tropes ever, which is the magical, pure innocence of children. There's this lengthy scene where he's laying around in the grass, hanging out with a caterpillar and a butterfly, and the doctor is talking about how he's growing up too fast, but he's just a special, magical child, and how pure and how wonderful. And that's the kind of thing that tugs at adults' heartstrings, but kids don't care at all. No, not even remotely. And like... Why do we have to be the special seed of the future? Let us just have fun and be kids. There was so much of that stupid shit yeah. in the 90s. <laughs> it's like the God, damn wiener kids, except... Well, no. you know, it's the boomers all fucking becoming parents yeah. and coddling their kids too much. It's like, oh my God, I'm a parent now. This is the most important job in the world. No, like when she's delivering... I have to go to all my kids' hockey games. Every single last one of them, no. or I'm a horrible person. There are some things in the movie that clearly should have gone an entirely different direction, because it's doing a a coming of age story when really what it should be is like a loss of innocence story right where it's like because everyone treats him like an adult he doesn't get to be a kid but unfortunately the premise that went with and said was isn't adults doing child things wacky isn't that funny that's well, the whole joke laugh monkey that's the one joke of this goddamn movie is robin williams is a kid but he's big but he's a kid but he's big but he's a kid yeah. ah! Robin Williams goes to sit at his desk at school and all of a sudden it's made of balsa wood and it just falls apart. So many fucking desk jokes. He's sitting in the desk and he's squeezed in and he's trying to grab his backpack on the floor but he can't quite reach it and he falls over. His arms are longer 
than the other kids. Mm -hmm. Why does he have to reach that far? You're doing the wrong joke. Let's also talk for a second about the specifics of Jack's mythical disability here and how it doesn't make any sense. Um, Mm -hmm. Jack is constantly doing little kid type acrobatics in this movie like riding a bike on one foot right. and just kind of sitting in weird ways and scooting around and doing things kids do with their much smaller, much lighter, much more flexible bodies. Yes. He hides in a box. And you can tell that Robin Williams is physically uncomfortable doing that stuff, but his character isn't for some reason, even though he's in the body of a 40-year-old man. If he's aging differently, there are certain things about him that would go away, not because he's more mature, but because his body yeah. functions differently. Right. He would have better coordination nation he would have had a boner like when he was four he's shaving at 10 but he would have been shaving when he was like freaking five yeah and he still has trouble with it when we first see him in quote unquote adult form in the movie he's clean shaven yeah so clearly he's been shaving sometimes we're supposed to feel bad for the parents but these are the strangest parents i have ever seen the very opening of the movie is the lamest Halloween party. Oh my god, I that Halloween have party. ever seen. Let's talk about those fucking costumes. So the first few frames of this movie are nightmare-inducing Halloween costumes. Disney Plus froze on us at the exact moment we saw the fucking pig costume with four tits. Oh god, with four human breasts, mind you. Uh, I don't think it was a pig costume. I think the face was another breast. I think that was the oh joke my, of the oh costume. Oh my god, this was rated PG thirteen. <laughs> Tit homunculus. The family is dressed as the Wizard of Oz characters. And these two fucking piece of shit bitches are like, oh, she's fat. She's only two months pregnant and she got so fat. Yeah, because... Look what pieces of shit we are. And the sad thing is, she didn't. No, she did not look nine no, months pregnant. That's why they had to have those characters, because she doesn't look pregnant no. in the scene. Especially because the way you would like demonstrate something magical is happening is having her get bigger in the uh, middle of the party, which I guess it's not really magical. They explain it away as some sort of... It's basically yeah. magic. Yeah. No one really yeah. has this affliction. She gives yeah. birth to this full-term baby at two months of pregnancy, and the doctors are just, huh, that's weird. That's yeah. early. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? They, they pay lip service to the concept of being flummoxed by this well, new development in human evolution. Well, like, evolution. doesn't their prenatal doctor deliver the baby? And like, oh, yeah. he's just like, Ooh, whatever. You are a doctor. I used to work in healthcare. They would see something is wrong right away. Nobody's acting like it's a miscarriage or something horrible. They're all just like, oh, this is kind of weird. Like, watch the scene. The doctors and the parents are remarkably nonchalant about Mm -hmm. this super preterm birth. Do we want to talk about the fucking metal detector gags? Oh, God. Where the dad is dressed as the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. And he keeps having to go through the metal detector and he takes everything out of his pockets. Well, I don't have anything else. Mm. The woman dressed as the martini fucking can't get through the thing. And then a guy dressed as a box of cigarettes walks up and they're like, oh, sorry, sir, you can't smoke in here. Oh, God. I kind of thought the Tin Man thing was funny. But then they like double dipped in the same joke and I'm like, you actively now have made the previous joke not funny. There was one joke in this movie that I kind of found funny and that was after Jack gets arrested. And the cop is giving him back his stuff. And it's, of course, all this kid stuff. And then Jack says, where's my pog? And the cop just kind of looks around and he, fine, all right. He takes it out of his back pocket. The cop confiscating a pog got a genuine giggle out of me. Because this was like the one year when pogs <laughs> yep. were a thing in the 90s. He's back in, in pog, pog form. form. <laughs> this, this movie. You sold my soul for pogs. Can we talk about how insane those parents are? Please do. So the dad is the one who works. And I think he's some like marketing photographer or something. He's taking a picture of these models with these giant, giant carrots. carrots. There's what nothing the so fuck? terrible as a pretentious movie. <laughs> I'm shooting it for the carrot board. There's a fucking carrot board? Hungry for carrots? Robin Williams is like excited and he's talking on his phone to his dad who's at the carrot shoot. Robin Williams is just walking back and forth through the doorway and at one point he gets this giant baguette and holds it like a boner. And it's, yeah. I get that something that kids do because they're dumb kids. I don't want to see that oh, shit. I'll I don't get see that boner. Oh. Robin Williams with a fucking bread boner. Wh- oh. Why? Jack's room is the size of three rooms because he can fit a study area for him and his tutor. And he's got like a circular area for his bed. How and- much does the fucking carrot job pay? I don't. He's got Because the, the house. mom doesn't seem to have a job. She's a fucking stay at home mom. The house is this enormous three story Victorian home that looks kind of in San Francisco. Yeah. I mean, I know it's the 90s, but come on. No. You, you weren't 
doing like, that well. The first scene of adult Robin Williams in the movie, they're framing the house like it's a haunted house on the street. The kids are wandering around going, oh, I hear there's a giant kid who lives in there. Yeah, and they Boo show Bradley him only in shadow. There. This is Frankenstein or something. This whole movie starts like a horror movie. After he's it is born. a horror movie. Yeah. <laughs> they're talking to the principal of the school for the first time. Oh, God. And he's really nervous and he's like, you're going to have fun at school, right? Yes. A little louder? Why do you need him to be louder? You know he's nervous. Why are you doing that? And then, of course, she finally screams, Yes! Yes! We're going to have a good time. Uh, nah, am, nah, nah. I am Speaking sure that scene Cosby. was in the trailer. We need Robin Williams to yell for the trailer, so we're going to do right. it right now. Or we're going to have Robin Williams do the Robin Williams thing X amount of times because we have to. They become friends with Jack, first off, because he can get them porno mags, but also because he can beat the other team in basketball, which we all saw coming a mile yeah. away. Like, obviously, they're going to get him for basketball. So they're just using his deformity to their advantage. They're not really friends with him. And that's the other big fucking problem with this movie. It all builds up to a scene where... Cosby tells Jack, you're like a shooting star. You're not like the regular kids. Every once in a while, you see a shooting star in the sky, and it's so beautiful that even all the other stars got to look at it, but it's only there for a very short time. And it's like, what did he actually accomplish yeah. to deserve that? Aside from having this fucking deformity, which is going to cause him to die really young, how is he in any way exceptional aside from that? Yeah. He's not. Yeah. He doesn't have any interests. He doesn't have any... His personality, personality is child. That's all it is. The disability is what makes you special. Not anything yeah. about you. I can compare it to Rain Man or What's Eating Gilbert Grape, where in hindsight, they are kind of problematic, but at least yeah. the characters are seen... As people, they have more right. to them besides, exactly. you know, they really do. I have a disability. You have a disability. I feel very sorry for you. I respect you like hell for being able to overcome it. But what else is your personality beyond that? I've never revealed this on this podcast before. I've revealed it on Twitter a couple times, but I actually have a mild form of Asperger's syndrome. And one thing I fucking hate is when people, and you see it all the time on Twitter, when they're acting like jackasses, and then they try to excuse themselves by saying, I have Asperger's, so it's okay. I don't know how to do this. Motherfucker, yeah. don't use that as an excuse. No, Don't yeah. push the rest of us under the bus with you. You're not an asshole because you have Asperger's. You're an asshole because you're an asshole. And there's just nothing exceptional about Jack, aside from his affliction. The uh, emotional crescendo at the end of this movie is Robin Williams has been sitting in his room for two weeks, depressed. His mom won't let him go back to school. And one by one, all of the oh. kids in the neighborhood, all of his friends, and Can even Jack just kids that aren't his play? friends, yeah, they just show up at his door and start going, "Could Jack about to play?" And it's this big, they like, get inspiring, a trampoline? Oh, yeah. yeah, it's Where'd this big get the trampoline? inspiring scene that just keeps going into absurdity, <laughs> and Jack is getting more and more and more yeah. encouraged, and then. The scene ends, and he doesn't come out I to know. play. No! <laughs> they fucking blue-balled us on that well, shit, man. So and bad. Like, I was seeing this, and I'm like, what kind of, oh, Captain, my Captain, horse crap Oh, Captain EO, my shit? Captain EO. I see what they were going for on paper, where the beginning of the movie is with him having no friends, and so he wants to go and get them. So now he has, like, all the friends. He's achieved his character arc, but they should have had him come out to play with them. And that was probably like the original ending to the movie until someone wanted to add the sappy graduation scene. Or they realized it looked really weird seeing a bearded Robin Williams come out to play with a bunch of children. Yeah. yeah. Like, it looks weird enough when it's regular Robin Williams, but with him, like, a full depression beard. Just the escalation of it, how they've got the trampoline, and then suddenly they're playing street hockey. I just wanted, like, a parade to go through <laughs> with a bunch of elephants. And like, it's all, it's Ken, all in, like, Jack, weird. come out to play! Is the entire population of San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. Da -da 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 -da. Big drill machine comes out from under the ground, and Elon Musk steps out. <laughs> <laughs> Can Jack come out to play? And it's all in weird, fast motion, too. Yeah. Like, it's about to break out into a Jean-Luc Godard movie or something. It's, it's well, so it, weird. The stupid essay at the end. Oh, Jennifer oh. Lopez gives all the kids an essay, which is literally just what I want to be when I grow up, which is an essay for fucking kindergartners, mm -hmm. not fucking 10-year-olds. And she gives them 
them the entire rest of the semester to finish it in fucking October. Yeah. And I know it's October because there's fucking pumpkins on her desk. That's what passes for a ticking clock, basically, what, in this movie. What is I that? got the whole semester to finish this stupid essay about what I want to be. What is that terrible line he says when he's thinking about it? The scene of him doing the math on the paper right. of how fast he ages and concluding that by the time he's 30, he'll be 112. What do I want to be when I grow up? Alive. <laughs> Which is sad because the scene would have been better if he had just said nothing or just the question, what do I want to be when I grow up? Because then the audience would fill it in. But because you've spelled it out, you made the scene worse. I was reminded several times in this movie about Todd in the Shadows review of The Next Best Thing, where he says, everything about this movie is wrong. The casting is wrong. The font is wrong. Oh, on the, the font, credits. The font is wrong. The font looked like a fucking ransom note. There's this credit sequence of the baby being examined by all these scary medical instruments and stuff while the whimsical font of the credits goes by with the fucking <laughs> Brian Adams song and uh, <laughs> baby, there's a light of a day no, you're a child but you're too, too big with the child of a <laughs> day <laughs> You're Robin Williams, and you can buy her own porn. We gotta talk about this score. It sounded like a sad clown was put into a room full of instruments and said, make whatever you want, buddy. The instruments are your canvas. And then the clown became a doctor, and that was another Robin Williams movie. <laughs> Scenes, dialogue-wise, will reach the point in the scene where like, okay, that should be the end, or that should be the emotional crescendo, or that should be end! the button. End! And then and it just keeps going and the music keeps going. It's almost like somebody just dragged some royalty-free music from the internet and put it onto the movie at certain points because the music is just not lining up with any of the emotions on screen. Not that there's any emotions on this screen. This movie is almost two hours long. I remember at one point we stopped to take a bathroom break and we're like, there are still 45 minutes of this yeah, thing. And we, we all just hell? like it is buried our faces. Oh. The composer on the movie that we were just making fun of wrote the music for Die Hard, all the lethal weapons, X-Men, what else was oh, on Oh, Michael there? Kamen? Yes, Michael what? Kamen. He also Fuck. did the score for the Iron Giant. The what Iron the Giant. Hell? Wow. He's a great composer. I don't know why they're doing this. <laughs> he just shat out yeah. whatever. He was like, I'm not the, using these. Yeah, pretty much. Take this, shit. this movie is not the best work of anyone who worked on it. No. It may be the worst work of many of the people who oh, worked absolutely. on it. Everyone owed someone a favor. <laughs> that is the only way I can explain they got so many talented people into this. There was some kind of contractual snafu or one of those Harvey Weinstein backroom deals you have. <laughs> Have Probably. to do something. Everyone <sighs> was supposed to do another movie for Disney, and that one fell through, so they were all contractually obligated oh. to do this shit. I will say one genuinely good thing about this movie, and it's a little thing, but they did get one thing right. It ended? Well, <laughs> it actually ties into the ending, where it jumps forward seven years, and you see all these kids who were 10-year-olds as 17-year-olds. They did a really good job of casting kids who looked exactly like older versions of the kids. Like, you look at each teenager, and you know exactly, okay, that's that kid grown up. Yeah. That's that kid grown up. That was actually a really good job, but that's a fucking casting department job. Yeah. That's not Coppola doing a good job. I feel like that's why a lot of the kids were cast in this movie. Well, we got to find a kid who looks exactly like a 17-year-old because we know we want to have that scene at the end of the movie. Well, this kid can't act. Oh, who cares? He looks just like the 17-year-old. <laughs> it feels so weird that Coppola directed this because you think of Coppola and you think of all these films that took years and years to make and the production went way over budget and he had this vision that was propelling him forward and here it's just nothing to the character aside from Robin Williams is a child go with it I had a vision for Jack and for Jack it was <laughs> making sure that I could put another room in my house that's exactly way, what I saw do you think someone at Disney Plus put superhero on this movie specifically as a fuck you to Coppola Maybe. just for siding with Scorsese <laughs> last year the one thing I see that has any form of the traditional Coppola image imprint on it is normally for these 90s kids movies they have very simple cinematography they basically just stick it sure. on a tripod and just hit record yeah whereas there's like these meandering long takes and they constantly the shot go, with uh, the, the newspaper the, yeah where... the feet they always pan up and down on people but the weird thing is in terms of the color palette 
This looks like a fucking Disney Channel original. It does. Movie. Yeah, it's visually uninspired. Which is it's what makes it so. Uninspired. It's visually such a stupid mindfuck. Here's the one stamp that Coppola put on this movie that does kind of identify it as a Coppola film is that pretty much all of his films, to one degree or another, are about isolation. Yeah. They're about people who are forced by circumstances to be on their own throughout whatever journey they're on. Jack, in this case, well, he's the only person with this affliction, and he feels he has to stay in his room the whole time, and that's where the isolation part comes in. But it does it in the dumbest way possible. Yeah. Where he doesn't even really do anything wrong. He just kind of misinterprets things, and then he gets all sad. I just discovered a quote from Francis Ford Coppola about this movie that simply must be shared. Jack was a movie that everybody hated and I was constantly damned and ridiculed for. I must say, I find Jack sweet and amusing. I don't dislike it as much as everyone, but that's obvious. I directed it. I know I should be ashamed of it, but I'm not. I don't know why everybody hated it so much. I think it was because of the type of movie it was. You mean bad? What type of movie? A bad... what type of movie it wants to be a it's bad a movie type of for movie. no one it was considered that i had made apocalypse now and i'm a marty scorsese type of director and here i am making this dumb disney film with robin williams but i was always happy to do any type of film it sounds so transparently like i needed work <laughs> good god i just needed work this just reinforces my frustration with auteur directors who made it really big in the 70s they make enough good movies they Sometimes, not always, they just go so far up their own ass, they can do no wrong. Even though eventually, they start making the same shit for the most part. Here's the thing. Only Coppola could make a movie this bad. (laughs) A mediocre director could not make a movie this bad. A mediocre director would not be so far up his own asshole by decades of being the fucking Godfather guy or the Apocalypse Now guy who everyone just worshipped. Coppola has every right to branch out as a filmmaker. I just wish he hadn't branched out with fucking this. Yeah. I think this entire movie was a fever dream that Coppola had while filming Apocalypse Now in the jungle. Yeah, this is like if Billy Madison was absolutely no fun. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned Billy Madison because my only thought at the end of this is, Mr. Coppola, what you have just filmed is one of the most (laughs) insanely idiotic things I've ever witnessed. (laughs) At no point in your rambling, incoherent film was there anything close to resembling a rational thought. I I award award you no no Oscars. (laughs) And may God God have mercy on your filmography. My notes on this movie toward the end of the page degenerate into... This whole Everyone movie on is this filler. This is now dumber for having listened yes. to it. <laughs> uh, this movie is unending torment. Make it stop and please. When Robin Williams died, every mm. fucking pop culture commentator on the planet, every movie critic was so quick to eulogize him and talk about how great he was and how he was a beacon of optimism. And even at the time, I was saying, you hated his fucking movies for the last decade yeah. or so. And this reminds me why. Because Robin Williams, look. I love the guy. I miss him dearly. He did not have the best taste in picking movies. Let's be perfect. Or he had a bad Robots, agent. anyone? Robots, fucking Patch Adams and Bicentennial Man, fucking... Mm-hmm. What? Toys. Toys. This movie, if you're thinking about watching it, this is not a so bad it's good movie. No. This is a horribly boring cringy, torturous to watch movie, and if you try to watch it for fun, you will turn it off after 20 minutes. Well, we couldn't, unfortunately. No. We really wanted I mean, to. It, I do think that if you get a group of friends together specifically to riff a movie, this is very riffable for sure. Sure. Maybe. But I still don't recommend it. No. My God. This is not just a dud. This is a catastrophe. What else can you say? What else can you fucking say about Jack? But now we got a very important question to ask, and that is, of course... What's the attraction? So once Jack becomes the most watched title, I can't even say it with a straight face. Once it becomes the most watched title on Disney Plus, how are they going to work Jack into the fucking parks? Zach. They're going to replace their Disneyland parade with just a bunch of people from the neighborhood going, can Jack come out to play? Can Jack come out to play? And though there'll be a trampoline that appears from nowhere. <laughs> just materializing. <laughs> Chris. They're going to build it next to the Haunted Mansion. It's just going to be a two hour line where you have awkward conversations with people and then you go down into a crypt and it's over. Kevin. They are going to reopen Wonders of Life, but this time it's going to be a combination of that and Cranium Command and you're going to see it through Jack's terrible 
horrible <laughs> life. Well, unfortunately, you're all wrong. What they are going to do is they are going to make it a contest where the genie, voiced by Dan Castellaneta, <laughs> goes into the crowd and picks a bunch of kids and sees who can act like grown-up Robin Williams better, and they call it the jack-off. Oh. 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 da 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 Your podcast is canceled. I know. So... What are we thinking, guys? What's the final verdict of this movie? I don't even have to ask. <laughs> no, this is, is this garbage. a Disney Plus or a Disney Minus? Kevin! This is not just a Disney Minus. This is officially a Disney I, Disney Imaginary. It's half of a Disney Minus. It's that It's a Disney bad. Minus Minus? Yeah. <laughs> F Minus Minus. Zach? I mean, do I need to tell? I mean, like no, I said. No, you don't. No. Oh. It's unanimous. Jack is a Disney Minus burn it to hell, salt the earth so that nothing may grow. Just a wretched fucking movie that never should have been made, but inexplicably was. Oh, motherfucking Never should shit. have been watched either. Best superhero movie ever. So, you guys got anything to plug? Go to The Voyages on the YouTubes. Check that out. Otherwise, my Twitter is at the RL King. My show, uh, Remain Seated with Chris Nebergall, where I do uh, analytical discussions of theme park attractions. We've had a bit of a hiatus, but we're coming back soon, and I've got a big trilogy coming out soon about westerns in theme parks, in which I'm finally going to talk about Ghost Town Alive, where you can also come visit me this summer at Knott's Berry Farm. You can follow me on Twitter at Arthur Knowledge. I post gay shit, nerd shit, that's about it. And you can also check out the company I work for, HobbyDB.com. We're trying to build this giant database of collectible stuff, so if you know anything about that, get in touch with me and we could use your help. And you can follow me on Twitter at Tony Goldmark. You can also follow this show on Twitter at EFVD Podcast. You can peruse my YouTube channel. I've got a lot of fun videos up from the last many, many years. And as for this podcast, you can find it at various sources. You can find it on PipeDreamPodcast.com, along with one of my favorite podcasts, The Weird Alphabet. You can also find it on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, all the usual suspects. If you want to help out the show, subscribe, obviously. Leave us a review. You leave us five stars. That helps us get discovered by the algorithm, helps people who maybe don't even know who I am discover the show, and that certainly helps us out. And if you want to help us out even more, you can pledge to my Patreon, and everyone who pledges to my Patreon, even if they pledge the bare minimum of a dollar a month, gets new episodes of Escape from Vault Disney one day early. You get to hear them on Tuesdays instead of Wednesdays. And if you pledge to my Patreon, there's still about a week and change left to cast your request for Patreon Request Month in April. You have until March 20th at 11.59 p.m. Pacific Time to send me a request, and maybe the randomizer will pick your request sometime in April. So stay tuned for that. Chris, are you ready to read out what the randomizer is choosing for us next week? I sure am, Tony. Okay, Smart House. Initiate random shuffle mode, please. Initiating random shuffle mode. Make a selection. Preferably better than this last one. And the winner is... Bug Juice, My Adventures at Camp 2018. Bug Juice, My Adventures at Camp. Is it a series? Is it a... It's a season. Okay, so how many episodes we got? 16. Okay, so open another tab and Google random number generator. 1 through 16. Episode 16. Okay. 16. All right. Join us next week on Escape from Vault Disney when we cover Bug Juice, My Adventures at Camp, Episode 16, Best Summer Ever. Nothing is so terrible as a pretentious movie. I mean, a movie that aspires for something really terrific and doesn't pull it off is shit, it's scum. And everyone will walk on it as such. And that's why poor filmmakers, in a way, that's their greatest horror, is to be pretentious.